Hello and welcome back to Aspen Talks Health. I am Dr. Nicola and today I'm joined by Skippy Mesero. He is one of my favorite people in Aspen. I love running into you in the streets. It's always Thanks. such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for being on my show. Thank you for having me on the show. I think this is, I'm, I'm excited. I love um, what you've done with the place. This is the nicest the studio's ever looked. So Thank if you. the conversation matches. Awesome. Um, Skippy is the city council candidate. He has also been a three-term chair for Planning and Zoning Commission and a two-term chair for the Next Generation Commission. And we are going to talk today about what leaders can do in their communities to make it a healthier community. And so let's begin with... Uh, your story. How did you end up being so interested in, in politics? Yeah. Um, you know, first, the apology. I, In being healthier, I like literally just came from the gym. So, good. Sorry. The only way I could fit it in. It's a crazy day. Um, I don't know. My uh, my grandmother, forever, I, I grew up with my grandparents. My parents had a, a, like a really protracted divorce since I grew up in the house of my grandparents. And my grandmother has always said that that she thought I would get into politics. And for most of my life, I was like, you're crazy, why would I do that? Um, and so it's really funny now to have kind of come back um, full circle. But I don't know, I would say like, you know, in that home, um, the idea of service and giving back was always really, really important. Um, my strongest role models were incredibly hard workers who came from nothing and created this incredible family and opportunities. They were the ones who brought us to Aspen. They came here in 52 for the first time. Wow. And um, they bought property in Snowmass in 67 before the mountain ever opened. It wasn't even a town. Uh, so Stein taught my mom to ski at two and my mom taught me to ski at 15 months. And I've been in love with this place you know, ever since. Uh, That's beautiful. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Uh, what's your mission? Why are you running for office? Oh, um, I mean, fundamentally, I think I can make a difference. Um, you know, like I said, my grandparents came here, and I feel like we live in the best place in the world. We do. It, it's amazing. <laughs> it's and, true. And I'm so grateful for that every day. Um, but it, it didn't happen by accident. Like, an Aspen doesn't happen by accident. And back in the 70s and the 80s, those people that came before us did some really, really difficult things that we very much, frankly, take for granted. I mean, the affordable housing program, which is the, the lifeblood of this town, um, the RET, the, the primary funding source for that, passed by 10 votes. Um, it was a hugely contentious program to intervene in the free market. The walking malls, it took 21 years to get those accomplished. And there were lawsuits and injunctions and like full on marches against it. Imagine tearing those up now and putting in parking. Um, oh. You know, the down zoning of the town um, was hugely contentious, um, open, open space. Um, all of those things allowed this to be like a full community when the rest of the country has been, and really the world has been sort of segmenting and moving apart. In Aspen, a place that frankly has a lot of wealth, which tends to drive that division sooner, um, we've been able to stave it off. But those interventions from the 70s and 80s are clearly wearing off, right? And so if you look over the last couple decades, our middle has been eroding. Um, middle ages, middle income, affordable places. Uh, and if we don't do things equally as difficult now, this town is not going to be here for our kids or grandkids. And so, you know, I'm 32, right? I'm probably the youngest one running, uh, other than Linda, by 25 years in the last 25 years. Wow. And so, you know, I've been saying, you know, the, the five-generation pledge, which is I want to leave this town better for my grandkids than my grandparents left it for me. Um, and I think I have a track record of getting stuff done, and this council doesn't. Yeah. So why, I'm going to play devil's advocate, mm. why is affordable housing so important? Well, think about any of the other priorities that you may have. So wellness, health and human services, the environment, transportation. You can work on and solve any of those, but if there's no one living here, who is it for? And if there are no employees, then there are no tourists. So both for the community as it views itself insularly and for the broader sense of community, which is those people that love to come and play here, right. 
without housing, there's nothing. None of it works. And right now, if we do nothing for a variety of reasons, we are on track to be another veil with 85% second homes of only the ultra wealthy that are filled two days a week or two days a year rather and have their lights off the other 50 weeks. Uh, and there's no society in the world that succeeds with only the ultra wealthy uh, and the servant coming from rifle. And by the way, if you think that that's acceptable where uh, I would argue at least one of the candidates running does um, because you know, he's wealthy and has sort of things settled. Uh, I think that's short-sighted. Yeah. You know, the, the valley's going to double in population. Carbondale's pretty damn cool. People describe it as Aspen in the 80s. Uh, we're not long from the time where the economic rationale for somebody to spend two, three hours a day coming to Aspen as opposed to stopping uh, in Carbondale or working where they live is not the primary motivation. And, and they eventually won't come. Uh, and then, you know, this is... Ashcroft in a failed experiment. It, it seems uh, trivial, but there's a fun factor to having locals that can, uh, totally. the, your middle class yeah. locals that are, that are alive and fun and exciting and yeah. it creates the ambiance almost for the yeah. wealthy as well to come in. And I mean, I remember when I was growing up, you know, in Chicago, because we would obviously come here and, you know, I felt like I had a second home. Like I felt like a local when I got here and I had friends. Um, you know, when I get to go to say like, you know, Steamboat or, um, you know, whatever, Alta, Crest, yeah, not so much Crest of Butte actually, Crest of Butte less so, but um, these resorts that have awesome skiing and I have a great time, but you feel like a client, you feel like a guest, you know, you show up, you've got your hotel room, you've got your hot tub, you go skiing, you go to the restaurant, you have a few drinks, you start over, it's a very different thing and um, so this this narrative that some try to push, that it's like community versus resort, is mm. is fundamentally ridiculous, right? I mean, there would be no community had it not been for the resort starting back in the 40s and 50s. And the resort that we have would be nothing like what we experience if it wasn't for the community because that's what sets it apart from yeah. every other one. So they're yeah. mutually reinforcing, and I think that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It, it, the community here is what sets Aspen apart. Mm -hmm. Obviously having Aspen Institute and all the intelligence that flows through here, but it's walking down the street and saying hello to all the people you love, yeah. and you see them all the time, and it's it's almost like a high school reunion every day here. It's such a, <laughs> that's how I think of it. Like, uh, less awkward, though. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, just, it's such a pleasure, and that's really the, the heart of Aspen is the community that lives here mm -hmm. year-round, yeah. not just that flow through. I, I always say it's the city with the most hugs per minute. Yeah, and it is like, I love I like that. It's true. It's great. Absolutely love that. Um, what are some of the main challenges that you're hoping to accomplish while you're, if you get nominated? Um, well, I mean, one, it's just time for some action, right? Old solutions aren't working. We need a fresh perspective, and we need people with a track record of actually doing the work and getting it done. Um, you know, you mentioned, like, you know, three terms on P&Z. We, yes. like, change the, the culture in that room in a way that worked for both applicants and for the city and commissioners. Um, you know, NextGen was this experiment that we just jumped into because the city asked us, and, you know, we went from young people don't care and, you know, aren't involved to having more young people try to get on that than any of the other big commissions that have been, you know, historically important. Um, when we saw the, the problem of, of voter turnout, right, um, we didn't just, you know, sit at the bar stool and complain. We went out and we changed the election date, uh, something people have been trying to get accomplished for 30 years. Um, so, you know, I would like to both be a voice for new ideas, um, but also the body to take those from conception through execution. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. That's more yeah. of the how, but feel free to dig in more. And I'm, yeah, yeah, please. So uh, let's go into the specifics on um, planning and zoning, for mm -hmm. example. Let's start there. Yeah. Where, what specifically did you do? I know zoning in this, getting something passed in zoning is a challenge in this town, but okay, a lot of people want it to be because yeah. otherwise you'll have too much development. So PNC is, um, for, I mean, most people don't kind of know the inside baseball, but PNC is not a policy setting body, right? That's city council. So, uh, but we are uh, an enforcement and a review body, right? Okay. So what that means is projects are coming through um, and we review them based on criterion that have been read for us. In some cases, interpret those where the code allows that latitude and others we don't. Um, so we don't have an opportunity to change underlying policy or zoning. Uh, that's what I hope to do on city council and I'm informed to do that. Um, 
However, you touched on something, right? You talk to anyone who's ever gone through any city process. Nightmare. It's nightmare. And part of that is really poor communication. It's lack of process. It's lack of um, continuity and sequence. And so when I first came in, I, I noticed that, right? So you'd have an applicant who would come forth. They'd have this project. And the commissioners would be like, mm, no, we don't like it for this reason, that reason, this reason, that reason. And then they would go and they'd spend, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars and time. And then they would come back. And then the commissioners had totally different reasons at the next meeting why they didn't like it. Oh, wow. Or they've moved the goalpost. And so understandably, hmm. commissioners are frustrated because they're just kind of reviewing the same things. Um, applicants are obviously frustrated and it's a waste of the people's time. Um, so, you know, we tried to, to change that culture to one where, you know, we took the premise of you follow the code, you don't interpret unless it's absolutely allowed so that you know coming in what the rules and expectations are. There's less ambiguity. And then when you're in the room, making sure that we have a more uh, discussion-based environment where we can tease out everything necessary to get to yes. So nice. at the end of the meeting, you can just say, right, like, look, we appreciate what you're doing, but the code will not allow this, even if we love it, right? This is not allowed, so if this doesn't change, you're done. Alternatively, these are the three things we need to get to yes. Please come back prepared, or you, know, you can yeah. take another option. And um, though the underlying code is not always effective at reaching the end goal that all the commissioners or the applicant may like, um, you know, you end up in situations where you're like, man, this is an awesome project, but like, I can't approve this. Uh, and conversely, this project sucks. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, I have to vote yes. Yeah. So we do, we do um, get in those places, but um, there's an expectation, there's a transparency, and there is a trust in one another that's emerged that leaves people leaving that room in a much better place yeah. uh, and streamlining the process. Love it. Yeah. At Next Gen, then, that w the goal there was to get uh, the younger generation involved? It was a city council top ten goal seven years ago, maybe? Okay. Six, five, somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, the, the, the goal was quite amorphous, uh, but it was, you know, how do we get younger people more involved in the civic process? And um, How did you do that? Mitzi Rapkin uh, started these kind of whiteboard sessions, community outreach director, um, sort of asking that question. Um, I ended up going to a few of those. Uh, a friend of mine asked me to go. And, you know, what kind of became clear to a group of us was, you know, all these people had their issue, right? So, oh, we need more housing. We need more child care. We don't like the curb cut on Galena Street. Like, whatever. Um, but they, they, were, they were ideas of the moment. And so the idea became, rather than trying to tackle these things one at a time, why don't we create a body that can exist in perpetuity, that could speak for that demographic, that could address whatever the issues are of the day? Uh, and so, you know, this group of us formed. We set a goal to become a city commission with the idea of creating that permanence and structure. Uh, and two years ahead of our goal, we had created the commission, and uh, I chaired it for the first two terms. And I said I would only do the first two terms because I wanted to have turnover and the organization to have like a long life. Um, and, um, you know, each year we poll and reach out to the demographic. The question is basically some version of, you know, what are the primary inhibitors to you creating a long-term life in Aspen? And then we go to work. Mm -hmm. So we worked on entrepreneurship and business starts. Um, we uh, created a mentorship program. We got it funded for a year through city council, implemented, and then wrapped into a nonprofit that's worked with, uh, I think, you know, probably upwards of, 30 businesses to date. Um, we've made significant strides on housing, even though we don't have a vote, things around um, categories, credits program. Um, we've also had some failures. I mean, we've, we've tried to work on right sizing and, and moving people within the system so that, you know, older people who um, want to live and retire here but are interested in a different product that better reflects their needs now as opposed to when they were 20, 30 and had kids um, could have that opportunity to move because yeah we put up artificial barriers to allowing that. Um, that, that didn't go so well, so we, we learned a bit from that. Um, and then most recently, uh, the, the, the change of the election date, which followed two years of get out the vote work, which saw a huge jump in under 40 participation. Uh, was that your in incentive? What was, why did yeah. you want to change the date? Why? Um, so 
this is kind of a separate question, isn't it? like yeah. back to just me being me. Um, look, I have been fortunate enough to have the ability to travel. Um, I think it's been the best education of my life. There's nothing I love more. Um, when I travel, I don't, I'm not like in Cancun with a margarita or whatever. I'm normally solo with a backpack somewhere really weird. Because to me, there's a big difference between vacation and travel. Travel is about like learning, expanding your horizons. Um, and so I do like think of myself very much as a student of the world every day. And I have, through witnessing alternative outcomes, come to so respect and revere our form of government, which highly imperfect, but um, man, do we take it for granted. And it's being challenged in a way that it hasn't been challenged uh, really since, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of uh, dictators and autocrats back in the, the 30s and, and 40s. Um, and so I think, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. Lord knows a lot's been given to Aspen. Um, and so I think we should feel a responsibility to stand up for our democratic principles and our democratic system. And the most fundamental element of that is participation. Because if everybody participates, uh, then people feel vested in, the, in that community. They have agency. Uh, and if you lose a battle, that's fine, but you trust in the system and you continue because trust is the lifeblood of democracy. Um, Alternatively, what we see now is more and more people not paying attention, the extremes getting more and more attention, which then further erodes trust. You're in this negative feedback loop. So I think if you can do something fundamental, which is just get everybody participating again, um, you, can, you can do something big. And so, um, you know, my, not much of my, but our, as a 2A team, the election day team, our goal was, that was step one, but we want to be the first city in the country with 100% voter participation. Model something scalable here and let the rest of the world try it. Uh, and so uh, it's something I'm really passionate about in yeah. terms of how to project into the state, the country, or the world. Um, but concurrently, it's also better for Aspen. Um, you know, when we have... 1,700 people show up for a mayoral race when 6,000 people are eligible. Like, that's embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. So the date was more, yeah, because of the seasonality of this place, really. Oh, wait, you asked me a much simpler question. No, no, but I loved your answer. <laughs> yes. But, but, yes. Yeah, yes. That was a perfect uh, answer. Um, yeah. So uh, for, for uh, the history of Aspen, yeah. our election date has been in May. Uh, initially, so what? We're a year-round mining town. That's fine. Uh, when we reconfigure as a seasonal town, right. um, that becomes season. silly. Yeah. So 14 of the last 15 years, the single lowest day of occupancy for year-round locals is during the election. That's just crazy. Oh, wow. um, so our view was any date was better. Um, we ended up going with March uh, because we went through a you know kind of two year process. We looked at every possible options. We did qualitative and quantitative analysis. We met with experts. Ultimately, we took the top three uh, options to the voters, and we said, "Hey, which of these three dates do you think would encourage the most people to vote?" Mm. Um, the one they chose, by the way, was my third choice, um, but trust in the voter. They said two to one March, so we said, cool. Um, huh. I can't imagine it could possibly be worse, uh, and if it's not as good as we hope, there's nothing to keep us from trying something else. Right. I'm very much a, like, try it if it doesn't work, iterate kind of guy, yeah. um, but this paralysis that we live in where we're like, oh, there's a problem, we can't do anything, like, mm -mm. No, good no. for you, good for you. Um, you mentioned something just prior about creating a mentorship program mm -hmm. that's wonderful yeah. what a great uh, thing that other cities can implement as well and and helping you're feeding the economy you're helping people succeed yeah i mean i think giving a, a leg up to people is important i mean and not often for not always for bad reasons sometimes for good reasons sometimes for bad reasons but you know we put a huge amount of roadblocks in front of our entrepreneurs, our business owners, our creative class. So at the bare minimum, we could extend back some resources to help mitigate for that oftentimes unintentional, sometimes intentional uh, difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. I like that one a lot. Um, yay. Yay. <laughs> um, I think this question is kind of obvious, but 
you have a desire to keep this place very walkable. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that's so valuable for the health of the community in general. Are there any other reasons that are coming to you that I don't, I'm not aware of? Well, sure. I mean, look, fundamentally, almost all of us are immigrants, right? And most of us came from large metropolitan areas, right? right? I don't know the number, but I guarantee it's upwards of 65%. I don't think any of us moved here for the worst parts of city life, right? <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. Driving and trying to find parking? Um, yeah, so I mean, I just think from a quality of life standpoint, yeah. I mean, it's no surprise to any one who's done five minutes of research that, you know, the old cities of Europe that are walkable lend to better mental health, physical health, communal health. Um, so from a holistic standpoint, like, of course, that's better. From an environmental standpoint, yes. it's obviously better. You know, do we really need 10 more idling Range Rover Sports? Like, probably not. I don't know. I don't. Um, and nothing against Range Rover Sports. I'm actually a huge car guy. Like, I love cars. I like racing cars. So it's not like an anti-car thing for me, but, you know, there is a, a, a broader argument about community health. Yes. That aside, we have to recognize that our, our most precious thing is space, right? I mean, we're at the end of a box canyon. Um, we can't go out. We don't want to go up, and we can't go up, and that's a good thing, right? But it means that space is very, very scarce. And so I think we need to reframe the question, which to me is like, what is the highest and best use for that space? Because everything is a trade-off, right? And uh, so where that shakes out will require talking to business owners, talking to community members. I don't think there's one perfect answer, um, but things like affordable business, right? Everybody bemoans the fact that we have increasing vacancy. I talk to business owners that we think of as successful every day who tell me like, yeah, maybe I got two more years and I'm out. Because at the end of the day, if the box costs 50 grand a month and you've got at best an eight month season, we are never going to get businesses that are not backed by larger national firms right. and that actually serve the community or, or business owners. So for me, I feel like the city needs to get in the business of creating cheaper boxes, right? Not picking winners and losers, um, but just creating the space. And so just use that as a construct, but not the only construct, right? There's 50 ways to get at it, but one of them is like, Extend the walking malls an extra block. Create a row of micro business stalls. Make the rest green space that could be open to the community. You could keep uh, one small lane that could do on-demand delivery from the downtowner or let you bike so you don't have an accessibility problem. Mm -hmm. In my mind, that is a higher and better use than a automobile that sits empty 20 hours of the day. Right. Right. Um, but it's a complicated situation because it is a trade-off, and you've got to figure out how to also accommodate someone who needs to drive or pick things up. Um, but that's that's the next question. That's not yeah. the first question. Yeah. To approach a problem because of fear of the known instead of possibility for the unknown seems crazy to me because there are cities all over the world that have mastered this. You yeah. know. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I hear from some locals that the concern is that peop the developers that come here that want to buy up the real estate and improve on it mm -hmm. then end up having uh, the expectation of... Um, um, then have the expectation of Sorry, that they'll be able to charge a lot higher rent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's almost... It pr prevents improvements in a way. Like, how do you develop and improve a town without then making it fifty thousand dollars? So, just a month? so I understand um, the idea that's been brought to you, yes. people's concern is that uh, building A exists, developer X comes into town, buys this, Correct. and he's not able to redevelop because no, his plan is to redevelop. Okay. let's say, but then his plan is to then charge astronomical rents, right. which pushes out all the mom and pops. Right. Right. And um, the well, true character of a place. Sure. Uh, I it's, mean, that's not wrong. <laughs> no, but uh, it's a dilemma. Like, you want to yeah. improve in a, a city, but at the same time, you don't want to lose the character. Right. Well, I mean, you can also ask yourself the question, you know, 
how much of that is true market-based scarcity and how much of that is self-imposed, right? So uh, one of my opponents, Bert Myron, right? He loves to tote the flag of affordable housing. Um, by the way, despite campaigning against Burlingame and chopping units off of city projects that we asked for more density on. So, you know, look at the action, not the words. Uh, but as, and I think it's a very clever campaign technique, he says, right, I'm the only one that's for 100 or 120% mitigation for affordable housing. Right, that sounds great. Oh, yeah, more money for affordable housing. Except he knows damn well that our initial goal was 60% in town. We're at 38% and dropping. So I, I think we have to reaffirm that 60% and actually go do the stuff to make it happen. But anything over that 60% is no longer a boon to affordable housing. It's an artificial tax on the downtown core that gets passed along to the taxpayer because now you've just inflated the building price of that building by how many millions of dollars and guess where that ends up? And the cost of your cheeseburger, right? So it actually is a very clever tactic huh. to control growth, you know, disguise to make us think that we care about affordable housing. Um, but so that same archetype, right? What are all the other restrictions, complexities that we put on every building that artificially raises that cost, Interesting. right? And, and so, so part of it is our, our own fault. Um, I personally think, and okay, I'm open to being proven wrong on anything, I think we're probably too far down the rabbit hole already to correct that in a way that is reversible. Like we could stop the bleeding. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't see us solving it in privately owned buildings at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the approach has to be to use city community owned land to address that. So whether it's the yeah. micro business dolls, whether it's a year round farmer's market, whether it's a Christmas market uh, on a park or, or some open space, um, but just creating that, that cheaper box. Yeah. Um, I think that's the way to do it because we don't have to fight all those headwinds. And depending on which approach you take, you could have, could have the ancillary effect of reducing rent seeking at adjacent properties. Okay, interesting, very interesting. Skippy, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Are we done? I know it goes what? so. I know it goes so quickly. Is there any final thoughts that you have for other yeah. leader community leaders out there to help make their uh, communities a little healthier? Yeah, I mean, care, listen, do the work. Like it's, you know, people say showing up is half the battle, and it's not. It's not wrong. Um, so focus your energy on the things that you actually care about that will drive you. Um, Listen to people, recognize that you know you don't have all the answers and you can be wrong and demonstrate you care. Um, and then do the actual work and be bold and brave enough to put things forward even when uh, some people might disagree. Otherwise you just end up end up doing nothing. So yeah. that's what Good I would say. Good for you at your young age. That's so what I would wise, say. <laughs> oh. Thank you again for being on the show. It's Thanks such a pleasure to have me. you and I really hope you win. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I would just ask um, anyone who has enjoyed this discussion, um, Skippy4Aspen, F-O-R, Aspen.com is the website, Skippy4Aspen. On Facebook, we post updates, um, upcoming events. Um, we'd love to have support in the form of endorsements, letter to the editor, um, dollars or time. It all make a big difference. Good. This will be the most pivotal election in several decades. And where we end up in five years depends on you showing up and making a decision. Love it. Awesome, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. And check out Aspen Talks Health for more information. And I'll put that contact info up there as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers.